<coughs> and what we'll do is I'm going to reintroduce the carry and also the borrow functions for binary numbers using logic gates. Okay, so I'm just going to recite you all that stuff at least here for the time being. And we'll, I'm going to do it in C code, so this way you, know, you, don't, you don't have to remember how to read the mathematical symbols. You can focus on the right hand side. The left hand side is really just how I enter everything in Markdown. In this case, it's not going to be that big of a deal because it's just your syntax highlighted on the right hand side and not so highlighted on the left hand side. All right, so we'll go ahead and just look at you know, the P function for borrow. Um, it's going to take U, V as the parameters. And the way it works is it simply returns whether u is less than v. So u is less than v, but because I want to coerce the actual return value to a 1 or a 0, so that's why I use a ternary expression to do that. So this is exactly the same way as it is in the notes. And I'm going to look at the c function, which is the carry function. It looks exactly the same except for one little detail. Um, Oh, this is the comparison. Okay, I take it back. This is not the Boolean version. We'll get to the Boolean version in just a little bit. So this one is um, u plus b is greater than or equal to whatever base we are dealing with. So I'm going to use e to represent the base just because you know, e is also the name of this function here. So that helps to avoid the confusion. If so, it is returning a value of 1. We have a carry of 1. If not, we have a carry of 0. And now you can put in the comment here, uh, e is the base. Okay, so are we doing okay so far with all this stuff here? This should be something that you go like, okay, yeah, you know, we're totally just reviewing things that we have already talked about. So then <clears throat> I decided instead of using um, arithmetic operation, because comparison is an arithmetic operation, addition is a arithmetic operation, greater than or equal to is also an arithmetic operation. So then I decided, oh, let's do everything using Boolean operators. So that's when we go like, oh, okay, so this one is really the negation of u and v that is not negated, and then use that to determine whether we should return a 1 versus a 0. This one, on the other hand, you know, once we turn it into uh, base 2, because you know, it only works in base 2, by the way, because you're know, only in base 2 can you um, use Boolean operators instead of, um, oh, okay. apparently turn off the, uh, <coughs> the insert mode, okay, so there we go, and then for this one, it is just simply, re simply returning u and v, so if that is true, return a 1, otherwise return a 0. Okay, so I think this part should still be familiar to you, okay, you know, there's, there should be no surprises here. Are we still okay here? All right. So when you look at the difference between the B and the C function, the only difference is whether we negate, whether we negate U first before we perform the conjunction. That's the only difference. Is that okay? All right? So that means <clears throat> if I want to combine these two into a single function, I can do something like this, okay? So I can have unsigned, we we'll just call it BC, okay? Because it can do both. Uh, once again, we have unsigned u, we have unsigned v, and then we have you know, some kind of indicator whether we're subtracting or not. So I'm using exactly the same name as the pins that we have in the circuit. So this way, you know, the symbols all correspond, right? You know, because you know, the C code and the uh, circuit symbol, you know, they all correspond to each other. So in this case, the easiest way to do this is simply to use an if-then-else statement, which I will connect, convert it later. So this way I can say if um, you, uh, if, sorry, if subtract, okay? If subtract is non-zero, we do it one way, else we do it some other way, and if we are subtracting, then uh, we are returning the B value, which is here, okay? So I'm gonna copy and paste here. Um, my, oops, okay, I can't do that. Um, my, oops, why, why? Y here, and then paste here, and then Y right here, and then paste here. I have to, yeah, because I was undoing the wrong uh, operation. 
situation, so yeah, it's okay, I got it. All right, so this is a combination between uh, the, the carry and the borrow. If I want to combine those two into one function, it's going to look like this, okay? We, have, we still have the single digit U, we, have, we still have the single digit E, but then we have an extra parameter of whether we are subtracting or not. If we are subtracting, then we return you know, what the B function would have returned, otherwise we return what the C function would have returned. So I'm, I'm basically merging the borrow and the carry function into one single function. Are we still do okay with this? Okay, so the trick here is instead of doing this, there's a better way to do it. This is a conditional statement and it, it, it relies on control flow to implement. So I want to convert everything into logic weights. So what I'll do is I'm going to invent another function here. Let's say it's unsigned <coughs> exclusive or. So once again, we have unsigned u, unsigned v, and this is going to return the exclusive or between u and v, okay, which is, I'm going to spell out the long version, okay, it doesn't look good, but it works. So once again, I coerce the result to 0 and 1, and then the expression, the Boolean expression is simply something or something. The first something is not u and v, the second one is u and not v. So I hope this is also not surprising, because I also talked about how exclusive or can be done using regular negation, conjunction, and disjunction in the notes. This is just the C++ spelled out version of what we have already talked about. Are we good so far? Okay. So once we have exclusive or as a function, <clears throat> you can turn it into a macro, by the way, if you want to. So now we can go here and go like, okay, we can now you know, take out all of this stuff here and have a single return statement. And then instead of you know, doing a negation here, we basically say, let's do the exclusive or between this and subtract. That would do exactly the same thing as what it did before because of the truth table that we have already talked about with exclusive or. Okay, so let's think about this, okay? We can run through all eight scenarios, you know, if we want to. So if you want to make sure that this does what it is supposed to, make a truth table, okay? Because that will spell out every possible way, every possible value for u, v, and also for subtract. They're all binary anyway, okay? Even though the type is unsigned, they're all binary, binary. Because in C, there is no bool, B-O-O-L, as a type does not exist. In C. It does exist in C++, okay, but I'm dropping all the way down to just base, basic C statements in this class. Okay, so now we will take a look at the truth table, okay, so we'll look at, look at the truth table. So we have subtract in one column, u in one column, v in one column, and then we'll look at the actual result of bc, um, you know, which is the exclusive or of, um, okay, I'll, I'll spell it out. Okay, so we have u <clears throat> o plus, which is exclusive or with v, and then this entire thing is anded with uh, v. Okay, I take it back, this is actually subtract. All right, and I think that's the end of the thing, the whole equation, and it doesn't like that because I forgot to use a backslash here. Okay, that works. All right, so this is how you make a table, by the way, in uh, Markdown, and then we'll give it like a vertical bar like that to turn it into a table, and now we can, you know, kind of you know, put in the actual value. So the first row is when everything is zero, okay? We are not subtracting u is a zero and v is a zero. So what we'll do is we'll try to figure out what this thing should give us, okay? Um, u is a zero, subtract is also a zero. What is zero exclusive or with zero? Zero. Zero and zero is, okay, all right. 
But is that the right result? In other words, if subtract is a zero, we are dealing with carry, okay? Because we are assuming that we are adding. So the question is, if we add zero to zero in base two, does it mean that we have a carry of zero? Makes sense, okay? So this row works. So we'll move on to the next row. Uh, zero, zero, one, and now we try to figure out what the result is. In other words, we are still adding, okay? Because when subtract is a zero, we are adding, we are trying to compute carry. The question is, if I add zero to one, should I have a carry of zero or a carry of one? No. It should be a carry of zero, but does the expression give me a zero? Okay, that's the question. <coughs> we'll work it out. Um, subtract is a zero, u is also a zero. Zero exclusive or with zero is a zero. Zero and whatever is a zero. So yes, okay, so we got this. But you can see that I, all I'm doing here is completely mechanical, okay? So you guys can do the rest of this table and convince yourselves that this function, BC, can indeed combine the calculation of a borrow versus a carry by adding one more parameter to indicate whether we are subtracting or not. Is that okay? So this is something that you can do, okay? And I encourage you guys to help finish up this entire table. I'll give you the template, okay? So this way, for those of you who want to do it, you can kind of do it in a relatively, relatively quickly. That's one more row. And what I need to do is to just kind of change these things to the pattern, okay? This is gonna be a one, this is gonna be a one, that's a zero, and this, these are all ones here. Zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, and then the one, one. Okay, so that completes the entire table. Uh, the end result over here, I've only worked out a few, two of them, and you can fill in the rest. It is not a homework assignment per se because I'm not going to grade it, but nonetheless, I think this will help you understand, you know, what is going on here, and also, you know, how this applies to the circuit. So let me just kind of magnify this so that you can see the entire table, and I'm going to ask, do we have any questions about what we are doing here? Does everybody understand the purpose of doing this? I'm trying to come up with one single mechanism that is capable of carrying out either an addition or a subtraction in base two because I don't want to replicate a structure of a circuit unnecessarily. I want to be able to reuse the same structure over and over again to save silicon. So we're good with this? Excellent. So now our focus is on this little expression here. Okay, U is one of the input pins, subtract is one of the input pins, B is also one of the input pins. Whatever is coming out of this is either the borrow or the carry, okay? So now let me go ahead and use this trick, okay? So I can take a screenshot of just the expression here, okay, like so. And I'm gonna open it with you know, a viewer, and I'm gonna specify, I'm gonna specify always on top. So this way, when I switch back to Logisim, this is also new. So the question is, um, which wire is corresponding to this expression? How do you find that wire corresponding to the result of the expression in the little box? Well, it looks like, okay, so this is how I would do it. Looks like it is the result of a conjunction, right? So the first thing you need to do is to find out uh, which gate in the entire design is going to do a conjunction or the AND gate? If you don't remember all the symbols, it's okay. You can click on it. So go to the selection tool and click on it. Ah, this one is exclusive OR. So that one is going to be exclusive OR as well. This is AND. So that means the result of the AND has to correspond to this wire. So I'm going to put it over here just so that we can kind of visually see that this wire is corresponding to this here. Is that okay? So now we double check everything because there's always a chance that I've made a mistake somewhere. So we want to look at what we are ending here. 
what we are adding here according to the expression, one side should come from B. So we track down B, we go like, okay, yep, yeah, confirm. Okay, because you, know, you can see how V is going into one of the inputs of the AND gate. The other side of the AND should be the result of the exclusive OR. Okay, it is the result of the exclusive OR. But the exclusive OR should be using V, excuse me, U uh, subtract as the input. So now we track down one of the input. It is indeed connecting to U. And we track down the other input of the exclusive OR. It is indeed connected to subtract. So this is how we can establish the equivalency between the circuit diagram in logic sim and the expression that I was with earlier to guide you because it's the, everything matches now. So does that explain? Okay. All right. So where we left off on mm, today is Tuesday. So where, where where we left off on Thursday was, you know, I finished the circuit, okay, but I didn't have time to test it, okay? So we're gonna test it a little bit today, and it is also a good opportunity for us to kind of practice the you know, binary subtraction by hand, because we have to kind of cross-check the result of the circuit and make sure that it is correct, okay? So we are, we are killing you know, two birds with one stone. So we go back to this circuit here, we're ready to test it. Indeed, you're already looking at a test. Because what the circuit is now doing is subtraction is a zero, so we're adding. We're basically adding zero, zero, zero at, in base two to zero, zero, zero in base two with T zero, excuse me, K zero also as a zero. And we are getting back zero, zero, zero as the sum with no overall carry. Does, does that seem right to you? You're adding basically all zeros together and you get nothing back. Seems to make sense. Okay, so it's now it is time for you guys to give me a tricky case, like maybe a subtraction, maybe it would involve like an overall borrow of one, something like that, okay? Give me a test case. Choose a number between zero and seven for x, choose another number from zero to seven as y. And we're gonna do a subtraction so I think it would be kind of cool if x is less than y, so we can actually tr trigger the overall borrow. So it's up to you guys to kind of determine what numbers you want to give me. Two and six. Okay, so we can do two and six. Um, so I'll do this on the whiteboard, okay, because you know, I can carry out the rest you know, on the computer here. So we want to perform two minus six, okay? That's in base 10. But in base two, we have to first convert two into a binary number and convert six into a binary number first. So I think I can try to do this in uh, Joplin, just so that everything is a little bit easier to visualize. Okay. So if you precede you know, the content of a line by, I think, four spaces, it becomes just plain text in um, Joplin. So one, two, three, four, but we need a few more spaces here. We'll just kind of like one, two, three, and then we have, uh, we can now start to specify the binary representation of two. What what would that look like? One zero. One zero. Okay, that's that is correct. But since we're dealing with three digits, we'll call it zero one zero. Okay, zero one zero. But does it make sense to you that zero one zero in base two is representing the value of just two? Does make sense, right? Because you know this zero tells us that we have zero of two to the power of zero. This tells us that we have one of two to the power of one, which is two. This tells us that we have zero of two to the power of two, so we don't have four. That's why you know, it does add up to just two. All right. So now we're performing a subtraction. Okay, so I have to kind of calculate the number of. Okay. It doesn't space out the, the way that I wanted it, but it's okay, I think it will still look correct. What about six? How do we represent six as a binary number? One, one, zero, because it is one, four, plus one, two, plus none of ones, okay? Very good. So we have one, one, zero, and I'm gonna line up everything. You know, just focus on the right-hand side, the left-hand side is gonna look ugly. So there we go, and then we just put a bunch of lines underneath. There we go, okay. 
So let me go ahead and also label each row because I want you guys to remember which row is which row. So now we have, this is our X, which is our minnow end. This is our Y, which is our subtrahend. And this one is our Q. So let me see how many spaces. One, two, three, and then we specify it's okay. One, two, three, and now we can specify. How, how do you compute the Q again in MaceCube? Which logical operator do we use between the X and the Y to compute the Q in MaceCube? So uh, X plus Y mod two would work, but that's arithmetic operation. So do you remember how to use a logic gate to perform this? Exclusive or, very good, okay. So now we just have to compute the exclusive or you know, between the row X and the row Y. All right, so zero, one has an exclusive or of one. One, one has an exclusive or with zero. And okay, you cannot see it because I have to scroll down a little bit, there we go. And then zero, zero also has an exclusive or of zero. This is our row Q. And now we work with the most important and difficult one. And I think that I have to backspace three spaces. One, two, three. There we go. All right. So now we have to figure out you know, the borrows, okay? Because this is a subtraction. Um, it doesn't really. In, in, the case, in the case of the subtraction, we actually have to work from column zero to the higher level, the higher order you know, columns. So now we have to kind of use a space or a placeholder to specify the location where we are not really sure what they are supposed to be. And then we go back and back to the step. Okay, so we have a bunch of stuff here, and then we go back here. And we are looking at D because it is the difference that we are looking at here. All right. So now we have an option. Because remember what I said, your T0 is an input pin. So if you don't want it to be the default of 0, we can turn it into a 1. So you guys tell me, do you want it to be 1? Or do you want it to be a 0? It doesn't really change the outcome a whole lot. Want it to be a 0? So do you guys have back there have a question? Nope. Okay, so let's not do this. Okay, because you know, you're in the class. If you need to have a conversation with each other, that has nothing to do with the content of this class. You can have the conversation outside. Let me come back in. I would not be offended at all. All right, so getting back in here. So we want to put a zero here. Is that a consensus? Okay. All right, so let's put a zero here. All right, so we remember we have to work the T or the K bit from bit zero and work our way to the higher numbers. So the first one we need to figure out is this one here. Do you think it's a zero or a one? How do we compute it? So we have to negate X and Y. So not zero is a one, one and zero is a zero. Then we negate Q and it with T. Not zero is a one, one and zero is also a zero, and then we or that those two results, zero or zero is a zero. So this is now a zero. Do we know how this happened? Where in the notes we we'll talk about this? Are we okay th at this point? Okay, so once we know this zero, the one that is highlighted here, or which is I just pointed out here. Now we can work with this column in order to figure out T2 this time. Yes. So that's our question Yeah, this is an input pin, and that's why I gave you guys a choice. Do you want it to be a zero or do you want it to be a one? One of the input pins. This one is computed by the B function applied to this or the D function applied to this. So that's why we can determine this is also a zero by applying the B function on XY and also on QT and then or the result of the D function return back. Okay. 
So let me go back to the notes so that you know you're exactly where the notes talk about this. Okay, so let's go. Let's go back to. Okay, so we are. All of this is in binary addition and subtraction, which is this note here. And that is, I'm not sure whether it's already open. Well, we'll open it again. So we are looking at subtraction. And we can just go all the way down here. And we can now see down right here. So you can see how your t of i plus 1, which is the t value of the column immediately to the left-hand side of the one that we that all the input bits are. So we, we can see how the b function is applied to xi, yi. It turned into the negation of xi and yi because of uh, the way it works out in phase 2. So I am just manually going through this calculation applying that to, you know, I'm trying to figure out this one right now, but I, I need to use, you know, not x1 and y1. So in that case, not x1 is a 0, and y1, which is a 1, 0 and 1 is a 0. Then we have to negate q1 and then end it with t1. Once again, we get a 0 because, you know, even though not q1 is going to be a 1, when you end it with a zero, it is still a zero. So now we have zero and zero, which will give us a zero as t of two. So we end up with a zero here. Is that okay? Okay, so we are we're trying to string a lot of things together. Okay, so that means you know having your own notes, having all the definitions in one place is going to be helpful. Because otherwise, you know, by the time you go like Oh yeah, I remember what the R function is. You're gonna forget what the B function is. Okay, so that's why you know I really encourage everybody here to take notes and put all the definitions in one spot. Okay, because you know that's gonna help you when you're studying. It's gonna help you in exam one, which is gonna happen in eh, about two to three weeks. You know, depending on the pace of this class. Is that okay? Okay. So now we try to figure out the last one, the most significant bit, which is the only question mark left over here. So we have to negate x, turning the 0 into 1, and y. 1 and 1 is already a 1. Well, we can actually stop there, because the result of not x and y is going to be or with the negation of q and t. If one side of an or is a 1, the result of the or is going to be one okay so we can make that conclusion that we have a borrow of one here you know, just because of that so now that we have the Q and the T rows already done the D row is the exclusive or between those two because it is the R function applied to the Q and the T but the R function in base 2 even for subtraction is just exclusive or so now we can work out the last row 0 exclusive or with 0 is a 0 Zero exclusive or with zero is a zero. One exclu exclusive or with zero is a one. So that is our result. What is one zero zero representing? Four. It's representing four. So now we are saying, okay, two minus six is a four, but we are forgetting that there's a borrow. Okay, there's an overall borrow in the entire calculation, which is this bit over here. So. That borrow bit being a one means we are owing how much? Where, what is the position of that one that I just pointed to? Right here. Which bit does it belong to? Which bit position is it? It's three. bit position three. three. Okay. And anything at bit position three means it is specifying the quantity of. to the base to the power of the position of the digit, which is 3. What is 2 to the power of 3? 8. So we have an end result of 4, but we owe 8. So when you think about we have 4, but we owe 8, what is the net worth? Negative 4. Okay, 2 minus 6 is indeed negative 4. 
So the overall borrow is very important because the end result here can, I mean, we haven't really talked about signed versus unsigned, so this is always non-negative. So how can you subtract a larger quantity from a smaller quantity and end up with a non-negative quantity? The answer is simple. You have an overall borrow that tells you how much you owe at the very end. Is that okay? Okay, but this entire thing is nothing more than working out the bits here so we can test the circuit. Yes? It is a four, but we owe eight. Yeah. So, uh, so, so we just leave it like that. We leave it like that. But that's all we can do when it is in the boiling down to the circuit. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to specify you know, two, six, and uh, t zero of zero and the subtraction in the circuit and see whether we get back the difference as one zero zero with the overall borrow of one because we. The, the original idea was we want to test the circuit. So we have to do something by hand first. So come, we come up with the answer, and then we test the circuit to see whether we get the same result. So now we switch back to the circuit, and we want to specify you know, this to be a two. Okay, so zero, one, zero is a two. One, one, zero is our six. We want, to, we want T zero to be a zero, and we want to perform a subtraction. So now we compare this with the actual end result of what we did by hand. We end up with one zero zero as the difference with an overall borrow of one. It all worked out, okay? So that means there are multiple, multiple ways for you to utilize this particular circuit because you can use it to kind of double check your, your calculation by hand. Give yourself a few examples to try out by hand, okay? Because when you are doing it by hand, you're exercising. Okay, when do we apply exclusive OR and how do we compute the entire T or the K row? Okay, you have to do it a few times to actually get the hang of it. Okay, and once you get the hang of it, then your mind will start to generalize. It's like, okay, I see the pattern. Okay, I can problem solve, you know, with, because you're familiar with the process. Okay, with what, you, what it takes. The, yeah, go ahead. So if we put a one in T0. Uh huh. Well, we'll try to figure that out, okay? So that's a very good question, and you are correct. But I want to go through the calculation over here, okay? So what the question was, what if I turned T0 from a zero to a one? So let's go ahead and recompute everything, because you know these would all be unknown, and these will all be unknown as well, you know, because of that, because we changed one thing. But this time I'm going to do it really fast, okay? So, you know, it's going to be quick. Uh, T1 is going to be a 1 because 0 minus 1 is a borrow of 1. So I'm going to do it you know, really quick this time. And once again, because you know, 0 minus 1 is has a borrow of 1, this is going to be a 1. So now I turn that into a 1. Um, let's see. And then, once, and then we have 0 minus 1 over here. So that means you know, T3 would also be a 1 over here. And now when we calculate the D bits, the way you calculate the D bits, because it's just an exclusive for of the previous two rows, it doesn't really matter which way you work. You can work from bit two back to bit zero, or the other way around, doesn't really matter. So the, the way you work this out is one exclusive or with one is a, a zero. Zero exclusive or with one is a one. Zero exclusive or with one is a one. So you are indeed absolutely correct that the answer is a three, but still with a overall borrow of one. So now we can go back to the circuit, okay, and test it in the circuit itself. So we go back to the circuit and go like, okay, what if we turn this into a one? We got zero, one, one as the difference and still have the overall borrow of a one. Is that okay? So very good, okay? So that means you know, this circuit, you know, as I said, would serve two purposes. One, it is the circuit way of looking at the equations of how the different bits are related to each other. But two, which is more important, is it gives you the proper answer. So you can use this 
to practice carrying out binary subtraction or binary addition by hand, just to make sure that you understand how to do it by hand. Is that okay? So as a three bit by three bit, you know, with a programmable you know, T0 or K0, and we can perform either subtraction or addition, this will give you 256 cases already. So that's plenty, okay, for your practice purposes. Do we have any questions about how you can utilize this particular circuit? Well, some people may be asking, but what about the cues? Right? I need to know about the cues too. So where are the cues? The cues are actually not visible here. The cues are hidden in the full adder subtractor. So you kind of have to do a right click and then show you know, a view FAS. Then you can see the cue. <laughs> so it's, it's one little step that you have to go in to find out you know, this is actually cue zero because we are looking at the bit zero of the FAS for the full address subtractor. So when you go back to the three by three essay, this one is for bit zero, this is for bit one, this is for bit two. So they correspond to the columns. All right, so are we doing okay so far with this circuit? All right, so it is in the announcement. You can download it and you can open it, you can document it, you can print it out, bring it with you in the exam, do whatever you want, okay? You can push it on the internet. The only thing I really do not want you to do is to say this is yours, that you made it, okay? So to, as long as you say that this is you know, something that Tech you know, made, you know, it's all good, okay? You can do whatever you want with it. You can even sell it or try to. As long as you acknowledge that I made it, you can try to sell it. <laughs> You can, you can be my distributor. <laughs> That's the whole idea of open source and creative commons. You know, the license does not exclude selling something for profit, but you always have to acknowledge you know, who made it and where to find it for free. If given that information, people still go like, I don't want to have to recompile the source code of Linux and all the associated tools. Just give me the CD, okay? You can sell the CD legitimate, legally. Just remember to pay pay the uh, the taxes according to the sales. You don't want to get on the wrong side of the IRS. <clears throat> they can do things that even the FBI cannot. Just just look up the story of Al Capone. Who's that guy? Mobster. The FBI couldn't get him. The Chicago Police Department couldn't get him. What got him was the IRS. It's like, we don't care how you make your money, but if you don't pay your taxes, we're gonna freeze all your assets. So, you know, he has no cash, the bank is frozen, you know, all his assets were frozen. So, how do we pay the guys? Uh, sorry, you guys have to, you know, can you, are, are you guys willing to put in some sweat equity? No. <laughs> that doesn't work with a mob, okay? So, you know, that was the downfall of, you know, Al Capone. The IRS got to him. Yeah, so never owe tax, ever. All right, so this is all done, and we are going to move on and talk about something that's new. Hopefully you guys got a chance to read this module, because it is... I would say a little bit involved, okay? The math here is a little bit involved because it is new to some of you, not all of you, okay? So the first thing we want to do is to uh, kind of have a quick introduction here. So the quick introduction is um, what kind of range are we talking about when we look at a base two number? So we are talking about the second paragraph here. Based on the description, the, 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 based on the discussion of how values are represented by numbers in module 0282, a base two number with digit zero to W minus one, which means they're at exactly W digits, can represent values from zero to two to the power of W, the whole thing, minus one. So we, look, we want to look at this, and the first thing is, okay, does that make any sense? Okay, can we test this you know, and make sure that you know, this makes sense to you? So this is what I do when I read some, okay? I will read a statement. It tells me, okay, this is true, okay? You know, 
um, given that you have W bits, W binary digits, you can represent values from zero all the way up to two to the power of W minus one. I want to double check it, okay? So I'm gonna, in my mind, I'm going like, okay, what if we're dealing with four bits, okay? In other words, what if W is four? If W is four, then we have digit zero to digit three, okay, that makes sense, okay? <clears throat> But you know, is the range of value two to the power of four minus one? In other words, what is the largest binary number using only four bits? What does it look like? Hmm? But what is what does the binary number look like? You know, when I want to maximize the value represented, then every digit can only be a zero or one. Four ones. Okay, so we have one, 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 one in base two. I'm just gonna do this on the whiteboard. So we have one, 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 one in base two. Okay, this is one way to represent the dealing with a binary number. So tell me what value this is representing. Did they say? 15, that's right. Because we have one of one, one of two, one of four, and one of eight. Eight plus four plus two plus one is 15 is 15 two to the power of four minus one. It is, okay. So this way, you know, I'm just going through a mental sanity check. I would call it a sanity check because it's not a formal proof that yet yeah, it seems to make sense, okay? So when you are reading material like this, okay, you want to kind of go through that mental exercise as well and go like, okay, can I independently figure out a way to say that, okay, can I at least find one example to confirm that this is the case, okay? Because you know, that's, that way, when you're reading something, you're already creating additional exercises for you to strengthen your understanding of the material. All right, but then what about the other integer values? For example, what about 19? Can 19 be represented using four bits? Now, that is a trick question, okay? That's a trick question, and that's why it has a tricky answer. So the tricky answer involves a branch of math called congruent modulo blah, okay? How many people have heard about that term before? Congruent modulo whatever number it is, okay? So that's okay, you know, I'm not expecting many people in this class to have some experience with that. Um, there's a Wikipedia page here, okay? It is a link to uh, modulo congruent. So what I'm really saying is, this is the representation of saying that A and B are congruent modulo N. Okay, this is my notation, which is a little bit easier. And this is what it actually means. So let me just kind of focus on these three lines over here, and then just kind of repeat what I said a little bit earlier. If you talk to a mathematician, okay, and you know, we have quite a few in this building, they would use this notation bars to indicate equivalency, and then you know, in parentheses you specify mod n. Okay. Uh, in my notation, I just want it to be easier, so I just may say, okay, let's use a subscript n here instead of you know, having to stab out mod n. So a for the both equals to b mod n. Okay, this is my notation. But that's just a notation. What does it really mean when I say three and nineteen? are congruent modulo 16. What does that really mean? It means exactly this, okay? It means that three can be expressed as some kind of integer plus some kind of integer times 16. And B, which is now 19, can also be expressed as some kind of value. Note that these two must be the same. Okay, so we're looking at one single B in both cases. K N and K K A and K B may not be the same, but N and N also must be the same. So we already know what N is because I said oh, I want to know whether three and nineteen are congruent modulo sixteen. So sixteen is N. Okay. Uh, we also know what A is. Okay. A is three. B is nineteen. What we do not know yet is what B is and what KA and what KB are. Well, I think one way to solve this is really easy. Make K of A 
zero. So once k of a is zero, zero times 16 is also a zero, so that means we can solve for the b as three. Is that okay so far? So if b is three, can I figure out what is kb? In other words, this is 19, b is 19, b is three, k, uh, k of b is what we need to solve, and n is 16. Can somebody tell me what kb should be? Or can I find an integer kb to solve that equation? Could be one, okay? That is correct. But as long as I can find integer values for ka or kb, and integer values for b over here, then a and b are said to be congruent modulo, in this case, 16. Is that okay? So there's an easier way to look at this. <laughs> I cannot, it's, it's harder for me to capture that, you know, in the notes, in the, in the written form, but when I draw this, you guys will go like, oh, why didn't you start with that? <clears throat> draw a big circle. And since we have modulo 16, make 16 slots out of this whole thing. Okay, 16 is easy because we keep dividing everything by two until we get to 16. So now we have a wheel, you know, and we can label these things. It's like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and finally 15. So what I have labeled in that circle are the possible values for b. Is that okay? So if I give you two you know, values, okay, this time I'm gonna give you something that's a little trickier, okay? So this time I look at negative five uh, versus, let me go through some mental math to get this, 27, okay? So I'm gonna ask, is negative five and 27 congruent modulo 16? Okay, you go like, how is that gonna help me? The way it helps you is you start with zero and then you turn a dial or you turn a needle clockwise to increase and you turn that needle counterclockwise to decrease until you get to the value that you want. We'll start with negative five. Is negative five on the negative side or the positive side of zero? We always start with zero on the negative side. Right? So we have to turn that needle clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. And up to five times, right? So we go like, okay, this is negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, this is negative five. <clears throat> Note that spot. Now we look at the 27, okay? So 27 is a little bit of a hassle because you know 27 is a non-negative number, which means we have to turn the needle very good. So we have to turn it clockwise exactly 27 times, okay? So that's going to be a little tedious, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, right there. Okay, so 27 also lands on the same spot because negative five and 27 both land on the same spot in that circle, they are congruent modulo 16. Is that okay? That's all it is, okay? It is just a really kind of strange way of looking at numbers and go like, instead of the number line, which extends to infinity on both ends, now we have a circle. Okay? You just keep turning that thing, turning that needle you know, in one direction until you get to the value that you want. Or turn it in the opposite direction if the sign is opposite. And if two numbers land on the same spot in the circle, then they are called congruent modulo, in this case, 16. So are we doing okay so far with the concept of mod congruent modulo 16 in this case? Which sign? Oh, you mean the dot? No, the one after 
the pyramid thing. You mean this thing? Yeah. That's con conjunction. That's and. A and B. Yep. We actually introduced this symbol in the on the first day of this class when we introduced um, how we can use NAND to implement all the other logical operators. That's when we first introduced this. All right. So what does that mean? Why is it important? Because we can now say, hey, this spot here, there are multiple interpretations of what this spot actually means. Because in this case, it means negative 5. It can also mean 27. It can also mean 11. It can also mean just about any multiple of 16 plus 11. And that multiple can go negative 2. In other words, you can say, what about a... You know, 11 minus 160, yep, it will land on that spot. Okay? But that's not exactly useful because, you know, just because we know that there's a, okay, what is the bit pattern corresponding to 11? This is a base 10 number, so 11 is what in base 2? In other words, it would be 1, 0, 1, 1. That is correct, okay? Because we have 1, 1, 1, 2, no 4, 1, 8. They add up to 11, okay? So what this means is given a particular bit pattern, in other words, the voltage at the gate of transistors, okay? Four of those in this particular sequence can mean negative 5, can also mean 27, can also mean 11, and an infinite number of possible values doesn't make it very useful because you cannot really tell but which one. So the way we utilize you know, the math up to this point is we come up with a little table like this, okay? So this is B, which goes from zero all the way to 15, just like in the dial that we have on the board. This is Ka, okay? So Ka is just you know, always using a zero. This is A, which is, um, if you go back to the notes, A is, one of the numbers that is congruent modulo with B. And this is KB, KB is negative. So you can see how we can use this and say, oh, okay, so if we don't exceed turning the dial more than one full revolution, we can still kind of say, oh, I know what this is representing because it only happens once in the entire dial. But using this particular scheme, we can only go like, so that means we can only represent all non-negative values or all negative values you know, in one revolution of the dial, which is also not really helpful because a lot of times you want to represent you know, numbers that can go either way. It can either be positive or negative. So what we do next is we say, what about this? We use the first half of this from here all the way to here, but we only use a, a uh, being zero in this case, okay? And then with the other half, from here all the way to the end, we only use KB being a negative one. All right? So the bottom line is, let me see if I can find a different color pen, this one. So that means the values that we want to actually represent in this dial using you know, this color is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Then we stop with the non-negative values. And then the other half will be negative values. So negative 1, 2, negative 3, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 8. So now we have, we, we, we're still within one revolution, but that means, you know, if I look at one single bit pattern, there's only one way to interpret it. Is that okay? And that's how signed numbers are represented. We use one half of all the bit patterns to represent non-negative values, and we use the other side of the dial to represent negative values. Is that okay? All right, yes? In this case, does zero count as a product number, or is it a positive number? Um, that's why I said non-negative. <laughs> so zero is a non-negative value. Yep. 
So it is. So you you brought up a very good point because it went from zero only up to seven, because that is eight individual values already. So on the other side, on the negative side, we go from negative one to negative eight, which is also exactly eight values. Eight plus eight is sixteen. We use up every single slot in this on this field. Question. Can you ask the question again? I couldn't quite hear. So the bottom line is using congruent modulo math, we can now you know, work out you know, how to, you know, okay, first of all, we want to know the range of values. So we'll focus on this part here, which is a generalization. If you have W bits for an integer and it is unsigned, then you can represent values from zero all the way up to two to the power of W, the whole thing, minus one. Well, we talked about this already, okay? This whole thing is just about phase conversion. So the phase conversion module actually can prove this is true already. But what about sign? In other words, what if you're dealing with the type int, int by itself, which is sign, then you are representing values from negative two to the power of w minus one as a whole to two to the power of w minus one as a whole, and then that entire thing minus one. So that means in phase, using W being 4, what is the range of the signed values? So plug in 2 instead of, excuse me, plug in 4 in place of W. So we have negative 2 to the power of 3, which is negative 8, all the way to 2 to the power of 3, which is 8 minus 1, which is 7. So negative 8 to positive 7 are the values that you can represent when you look at a 4-bit signed integer. Are we doing okay so far? All right. Which does correspond to what this bill is talking about. All right. So from here on, okay, so there are, uh, there are some interesting things that we can do with this. So we are going to introduce this math here. It looks a little intimidating, okay, but you know, we'll, we'll try to work this out. So by the definition of congruent modulo n, uh, we know this, okay. The negation of V is also modulo, congruent modulo N with negative V, which is the value that we are dealing with, plus whatever multiple of N. Okay, because that's how congruent modulo N is defined. So now we want to consider a much more special case when K equals to one. So in other words, this is just one. So negative V is now Mo, uh, congruent modulo n with negative v plus n. Okay, so we let let's just you know, read one step at a time. Are we okay with this statement? Because n is definitely a multiple n of n. So whenever you add, whenever you add a multiple of n to whatever value, they are always congruent modulo n. Yep. Okay, so I got stuck on that. Uh, four one. This one is 15? Yes, because you have one of one, one of two, one of four, and one of eight. Add them together, you get 15. 
Huh? One of one, two. One of one, one of two, one of four, and one of eight. Because each digit is representing the quantity of the base raised to the power of the position of the digit. So we have digit zero, digit one, digit two, and digit three. So one is the uh, further to raise the power of zero. Yep. Zero. And then the next one is the power of one. Yep. Oh, we have base two. And yep. Why? Because it is. Power of because it's in base two. Yep. Okay. Is that good? Okay. So getting back to this map here. Okay. This step. Do we have any questions about the first step of the inequality or congruent module? Or whatever? Okay. We're good. What about the second step? Now note that the first step uses congruent module, and the second step is a strain of equality. In other words. Can I rewrite negative b or minus b plus n as minus b plus n minus 1, the whole thing, and then plus 1? So like, are we moving backwards kind of here? We are making something simple into something that's actually more complicated? Yeah, we are, okay? Um, and then from here, can I move to here? In other words, by using algebra and rearrange things a little bit here, can I say that negative b or minus b plus n minus 1, the whole thing, plus 1, is the same thing as n minus 1, minus b, the whole thing, plus 1. Yeah, well, I'm just using algebra, moving things around a little bit here. All right, so the bottom line is negative b is congruent modular n with n minus 1, the whole thing, minus b, plus 1. So like, okay, that's, how is that going to help? So n in this class is typically some power of 2, which is 2 to, to, two to the power of w, where w is the width of the integer. So typically what we are looking at is negative b is congruent modulo with 2 to the power of w. So throughout this class, we have been using w equaling 4, because we're dealing with 4 bits. And then 2 to the power of whatever the w is, minus 1, that whole thing, minus b, plus 1. Are we do do okay so far? The only difference between here and here is I say that n is two to the power of w. That's the only difference between what we have here and what we have here. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay, so where are we going with this? So let's work with an example, okay? Let's w be, let W be 4. We are dealing with 4-bit binary numbers. And we're dealing with 3 being B. And I'm trying to compute what is negative 3. So plugging in B being 3, W being 4, I can now say the negative 3 as a value is congruent modulo 16 because 2 to the power of 4 is 16. And the other part is just 2 to the power of 4, which is also 16, minus 1, because of this part over here, minus 3, plus 1. Okay? Are we still doing okay so far? So I'm, I'm generalizing, and then suddenly you know, I use an example. Look at this and go like, so what is the big deal? So the trick is looking at this number here. 16 minus 1 is what? And 15 minus 3 is 12, okay? So what is the big deal of that? The big deal is, instead of using arithmetic operation, can we use Boolean operators to find out what is 15 minus 3? Okay, so here's the magical part. Can someone tell me what is 15 as a base 2 number? We did this earlier. In fact, it's still on the board. What is 15? Okay, one, 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 one. Very good. So I'm gonna write it on the whiteboard. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and erase. <laughs> I can use this port. So we have one, 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 one in base two, and that's 15. Okay, because we just did that earlier. 
right? And we want to subtract three from it. Okay, can someone tell me what is three as a base two number? Zero, zero, one, one, because it has one, one, and one, two. Okay, so we want to do this subtraction, right? We just go like, ah, oh, we're gonna have to compute all the Q and the T and all that crap. The answer is no, because if the if X is one, 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 and Y is zero, zero, whatever it is, it's quick to compute the answer, because there's no way you can end up with a more. Of one. Okay, let me say that one more time. When the mean of n or x is one, 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 and the implicit t of zero is a zero, there's no borrow of one whatsoever. Does that make sense to you? It's kind of like in base 10, you start with 9999. Nine, nine, nine. It doesn't matter what number you're subtracting from 9999, nine, 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 there's not going to be a borrow of one anyway. Is that? Okay, all right. But in base two, it's, it gets even better than that, okay? Because what is one minus one? I don't think that's a very hard question, right? One minus one is zero. Okay, fine. What is one minus zero? It's one, okay. So you look at this, you go like, hey, I think D is really just the negation or the bitwise knock, the bitwise negation of one. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so that means if we know that we are subtracting something from two to the power of something minus one, we can just do bitwise not or bitwise negation, which means we're not dealing with arithmetic operations. This is called bitwise not or two's or one's complement. This is called one's complement. So so after some long derivation, you guys don't have to follow this. Um, we define the following, okay? So this is this is the bottom line, by the way, okay? So I just want to go straight to the bottom line. Is one's complement of x, x being a bit pattern, is the bitwise knot of x. The tilde symbol is actually an operator in C++. Most of you probably do not know it because it's not used a lot, okay? So the tilde symbol is what we call bitwise knot. And then C2, which is two's complement, is the one's complement, which is bitwise knot plus one. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at an example here, okay? So we look at three again. I want to compute negative three, so now it becomes you know, the two's complement of zero, zero, one, one, and that becomes the one's complement of zero, zero, one, one, which is one, one, zero, zero, plus one. So the whole thing becomes one, one, zero, one. Yes? Uh, I'm confused. So three equals zero, zero, one, one. Yeah, base two, so it'll be zero, one, four, and I heard it's the four, one. That's the same thing as what we normally do, right? So, all right, so after all that math is done, I'm claiming that arithmetic negation is the same thing as what we call two's complement. <coughs> so two's complement is defined exactly like it is done up here. You are performing one's complement, which is bitwise not, and then you add one to the result of the bitwise not. So that's what two's complement is, is you're adding one to the result of the bitwise not. You're adding one to the bitwise not of the bit pattern that you want to negate. Yeah, but that could be, well, my question is, is that the same process as what we did on four? So we're doing four one. We're just adding the three to it. Or the one to the negative three, or, you know. On the board, I did not do any of the, that math on the whiteboard. No, I'm saying like this uh, same process here, how we calculate one, 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 one to the negative two is the same thing we're doing here. But They're related. So this part, okay, so this part, you know, this example illustrates you know, how two to the power of w minus one, the whole thing minus you know, some bit pattern x, is really the same thing as two to the x, which is the bitwise knot of x. Okay, do you guys have any questions back there? Because I see some heads you're turning. No, okay. 
So this example is illustrating how this works. So what is bitwise log of x? Okay, I can I can illustrate that using um, logism. So let me switch to logism, and then we'll. Do I still have it? Yep, last one. There we go. All right, so let me build a new circuit, and we'll just say tilde, which is you know, the name of the symbol, you know, the little wavy thing. And we're going to pull a gate, okay, from gates, and it's a NOT gate. And we'll make it a multi-bit NOT gate, so let's say it has four bits, and then we give it a four-bit input and also a four-bit output here. So uh, control click allow you to multi-select, shift click, sorry. So click and then shift click allow you to multi-select. And I change both of these to four bit. And then make the connections like so. All right. Do you see how this is a bitwise knot? Let me go flip a few bits here. Like let's say you know, this one over here. Okay, this is bitwise knot, okay? So when the input is zero one zero zero, these two number. The output is one zero one one. In other words, for every bit position of the input, the corresponding bit position of the output is the logical knot of the original bit of the input. Okay, let me point it out. This zero is negated to a one. This zero is negated to this one over here. This one is negated, negated to a zero over here, and then this zero is negated, negated to this one over here. Yep. The, the slide? Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. I change this bit, pos bit position. That's all I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So if we started off with three because you know, we we we're trying to negate three. In other words, I was trying to find the bitwise the binary representation of negative three. So. Uh, just a little bit. So we first perform one's complement, which is what you're seeing on the right wall, on the projector. So zero, zero, one, one, when you perform one's complement, otherwise known as a bitwise knot, we give you one, one, zero, zero. But you have to add one to the result of the bitwise knot. So one, one, zero, zero plus one is one, one, zero, one. And that is how negative three is represented in four bits. You can always ask, ask the question during the lab time or when you have the question formulated. Any other questions? Yep. The always add on a new What What is that? It's just a name. You know, this is called bitwise knot, which means you're not. Be, okay. So, okay. Do you guys have a question? Okay, do you want me to clarify it? Um, I, I, yeah. I was just confirming that that was Okay, because when you guys are talking, people in front of you cannot hear me as well. Okay, so this is called bitwise knot because what is what is the logical knot of three? Okay, I'll, I'll present that question. What is the logical knot of three? In other words, if you just put an exclamation point, which is logical knot, and then you apply that to three as a value, as an integer, what do you get? 
How are we going to get that? You get a zero. Because in C, C++, anything other than zero is interpreted as true. Anything other than zero is true. Zero itself is false, right? So three is not zero, and therefore it is true. Not true is false, and false is only represented by which value again? Zero. So not three is zero. Logical not three is a zero. When you look at the other side, we have one, one, zero, zero. What value is it representing? Give me the unsigned interpretation. We have no one, no two, one four, and one eight. Twelve, right? So what is the negation of twelve? It is also zero. So that's the difference between a bitwise knot versus a logical knot. Because if you are to apply logical knot to zero, zero, one, one, you just get zero back. But if you apply bitwise knot, then you get one, one, zero, zero back. The, the term bitwise basically means we look at each bit position of the number and we apply the logical operation specific to that position. So bit zero is bitwise not into bit zero. Bit one is also logical not into bit one. Bit two is logical not into bit two. Bit three is also logical not into bit three. That is why it is called a bitwise not operator. Is that okay? All right. So we just have to use the result of the bitwise not, and if we add one to it, that becomes two's complement. We first apply this. Okay. Let me let me let me finish the entire thing. Okay. You know, I can actually do this entire thing using logisim, and I can share that with you, you know, in case you guys are interested okay so we can now specify an adder yes there's an adder to make things a whole lot easier so now we can say what are we adding okay one thing that we are adding is this here and then we can specify a constant there's a way to specify a constant in wiring so we pull a constant here yeah the width is not matching because I forgot to change the adder to 4 bit okay, so let me Change that to four over here. And we are adding one with a carry in of zero. Okay, once again, <clears throat> uh, with this match, so I have to specify four data bits and specify the value as one. And then we still have to specify a constant of zero as carry in. So let me go pull another constant here and hook it up to here and turn that constant to a zero. And then what we are really interested in is what is the output here, which is also going to be four bit wide. This is two's complement using logic gates. This is the input, this is the output. Are we good? Yep, yeah. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Because we have that huge, long, you know, really cumbersome derivation. <laughs> that plus one is this plus one here. And that plus one never got away. The, the plus one here is because, you know, we want to do a subtraction by one here so that we get to 15. The reason why, we're to get to, why we want to get to 15 from 16 is because of this. When we perform 15 minus you know, something, that turns into a bitwise knot. So that's why you know we, if we have to take one out here, and we have to do a subtraction of one here, that one has to go somewhere. I cannot just not do the not counter you know, that subtraction of one. That's why we ended up with a plus one here, and that plus one stays. So this whole thing, this part here, becomes bitwise knot, which is easy to do with logic. Plus one is still kind of hanging out here, and that's why you know, everything after we perform to, to uh, one's complement, we have to do the plus one in order to finish the entire operation. So now here is you know something that's kind of fun to watch. 
is, well, since yield 2's complement, which is this entire circuit, we are basically saying whatever the input pattern is here, this is representing the arithmetic negation of this value. Is that okay? So we are looking at 3 versus negative 3 here. So now one thing we might want to do is to go like, so if I negate negative 3, what should I get back? Come on, you guys can do this math. What is the arithmetic negation of negative 3? It, it should be 3, right? So that means if I were to flip this around and say, let's specify 1, uh, what was it? One one zero one zero one one, right? No, it's one one zero one. That's right. Okay, we should get zero zero one one back, and we did. Isn't that kind of magical? No, it's not magical. It is all logic. Yes. <laughs> Yes, this is the plus one. This is the one of the plus one. This is performing the uh, one's complement. This is performing the last add one to it, the whole thing. Yep. So in, in summary, mm -hmm. the logistic one will perform the actual Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Another question. What about zero? What is the arithmetic negation of zero itself? What is that? It's just zero, okay? The arithmetic negation of zero should be zero itself. So that, that's another thing we can test. Are we gonna get zero back? Yes, we do. Is that okay? So now we can look at this wheel over here and go like, okay, we can play with these guys, right? So these are all the negative values. So you, you pick one of these, uh, we chose, okay, let's try negative 5, okay? We want to see how negative 5 is represented. So what you do is you specify, excuse me, you specify 5 here. So what does 5 look like as a binary number? 0, 1, 0, 1, that is correct. So 0, 1, 0, 1, and the result is 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay, does that work? Because you know, negative 5 is here, we're looking at a binary pattern that can also be used to represent 11. So how do you represent 11? One, zero, one, one, because it's one, eight, no four, one, two, and one, one. So it all works out, okay? Now, I, I, I think at this point, most of you have this question in your head. It's like, so when we look at the big pattern, one, zero, one, one, is that 11 or is that negative 5? That's a very legitimate question. Okay, how many people, you, know, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. How many people have this question in your head? It's like, I look at a particular bit pattern, what is it representing? Is it representing 11 or is it representing negative 5? My answer to that question is, may sound really inappropriate, okay? But I'm gonna say anyway. Why do you want to know? What is, what is it to you? Okay? But it's a legitimate question, okay? Why do you need to know whether 1, 0, 1, 1 is representing a negative 5 as a value versus 11 as a value? Does it affect addition? No. The circuit that we use for addition will work either way. Okay? So why do you care? The only time you need to care is when you're comparing. Okay? So I'll give you an example. So if you are looking at a bit pattern, say 0, 0, 0, 0, and you are asking, is this less than 1, 0, 1, 1 in base 2? Now you care. Because if 1, 0, 1, 1 is representing 11, then 0 is less than 11 is true you go to the then branch of your statement. On the other hand, if 1011 is representing negative five, then zero is less than negative five is false, and you go to the else branch. Is that making any sense? So that means 
for calculations, we don't care, okay? One zero, one one can represent whatever it wants to. But when it comes to decision making, okay, I'm comparing the values, then it matters. So we haven't talked about comparison yet, okay? So that means up to this point, most of the time, you don't really need to know unless you, the question is asking you, you know, what is the signed interpretation or the, what is the unsigned interpretation of something. To get the lab today done, okay, you need to have you know, a few more pieces of information. So they are all at the very end here. <laughs> yes, you know, I know how much you guys like equations, but here they are. VU stands for a value interpreted unsigned of a bit pattern X up to W bits. VS, as you might have guessed, is the value interpreted signed of a bit pattern X up to W bits. Okay? So I know the equations look kind of ugly. So what I'll do is I'm going to work, uh, work out a few examples. <clears throat> and hopefully that will help you know when to apply these equations and how to use these equations. All right, so V U unsigned of one zero one one in phase two, four bits. Okay, how do we expand this out using the sigma notation? Wait, I think we have seen this before. Isn't that the same thing in the phase conversion thing? We are adding up the product of each digit and the power of the base to the position number. It is exactly the same thing, except this time I, I, only, I only want to go from zero to W minus one. That's the only that's the only difference. So this thing boils down to take this one, take this one, take this zero, take this one. Okay, it's uh, one plus two plus zero plus eight. Oh, that's eleven in base ten. Are we good so far? So VU is something that you have done already. There's no big deal to it. Are we good so far? All right, so now we want to work with VS, okay? So VS is a little bit new. We're gonna use this part here, but use the same bit pattern. VS of the same bit pattern, one zero one one in phase two, using four bits. The first part is the same. What is the difference when you look at the sigma notation? You can see how this one ends with W minus one, which means when W is four, it ends when it is three. This one ends with W minus two. So that means when W is four, we end with bit two with the sigma notation. The leftover term is on its own on this side. Is that okay? So when we expand this, then we get the same thing for the first part. One times two to the power of zero plus zero. Oh, another one, sorry. Plus one. One times two to the power of one plus zero times two to the power of two. Okay, that part is the same. What about the last term? What happens when? Do, what happens with this particular digit here? Look at the equation. How it's defined. We are forcing that to be a subtraction not part of the addition, it's not part of the sigma, it is a subtraction. So in this particular case, what are we subtracting? What is digit three? This is, um, this is my binary number, what is digit three? It's a one times two to the power of what? Three, that's right. So the eight that was added here is now subtracted. So what do we get? This is one, this is two, this is zero, minus eight, we get negative five. Is that okay? So, so there are four things that you, I can ask you in today's quiz. I can give you a bit pattern, and I can ask you what is the unsigned value of that bit pattern. What do you do? You just apply the bits. I can give you a bit pattern, and I ask you about a signed interpretation, you use the bits. I can give you a number, 
like three, and I ask you about what is the representa representation of negative three, what do you use? You use this. When you try to do base conversion with um, unsigned values, <coughs> you, the way you do it with four bits is like this. Okay, so you basically have four bits here. This is asking how many eights do we have, how many fours, how many twos, and how many ones. And then you work your way from the most significant digit to the least significant digit. So what we were talking about was what? Four, right? So you ask, do we have any eight in the four? Nope. Do we have any four in the four? Oh, yeah, I think so. But after the four is taken care of, we only got zero left, right? So is there a two in the zero? Nope. Is there a one in the zero? Nope. That's how we end up with zero, one, zero, zero when we're converting four into base two. Well, this can only go all the way up to 15 because you know, we illustrated that earlier today. So if I want to represent values that are greater than 15, then I need more bits. So what is the A421? Huh? Like that. Four, eight. Two to the power of three, two to the power of two, two to the power of one, two to the power of zero. That's you know. So I think exponent is the key concept here because you know, all of these are basically exponents of two. So that may be the kind of math that you need to kind of get a refresh on. Because we, when we talk about base conversion, that's how numbers represent values. So it has to do with uh, module 2A2. And the key equation here, so you, this whole thing explains what, how a number works, how, what each digit is doing in a number. And the uh, summary was this thing here, which is basically saying the value represented by a number is the summation of each individual digit multiplied by the base, base 10, base 2, raised to the power corresponding to the position of the digit. So that's when we first talk about you know, how we look at each digit of a number in whatever base that we want to look at. You mean from the earlier part, right? Yes, yes, in that part. Okay, so this is how the work, the math works out. You know, when we look at 16 plus 375, it is one times 10 to the power of one because this one is at digit one. Times six times 10 to the power of zero because the six is digit zero. The three is digit negative one. So that's why we multiply the three by 10 to the power of negative one and so on. That's the pattern of how we look at a number. So when you look at four, you do the same. Huh? When you look at four, like for this example, you do the same for each digit. Except the base is two, because we want to convert four 
to base 2. Yep. So same idea. It actually contains another equation you know, that will help you define to find out what one what each digit is. So um, this is the equation for base conversion. We did this in one of the labs. So review of this may be helpful. All right, so I ate up a little bit of time in the lab, so I, I can give you guys back you know, that five minutes. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the lab. The lab is, I forgot to take road today, which is fine, you know, because the lab is, in a way, its own road taking activity. So we are working with um, two's complement here. I forgot to you know, change the dates. So let me go change that. You might want to write down the access code. It is just negative all lowercase. Now I have to remember to change all this. September 10th. I'll make it due at 1.30 p.m. No. <laughs> that, that, that's way too much time. We'll make it due at noon. Oh, it won't like that. It doesn't like that. It needs that. Okay. September 10th. 12 p.m. Publish. So you should have access to it now. If you refresh your browser, you should see um, the activity called Two's Complement, and the access code is negative. All right. There are only eight questions. You know, I think four belong to one category. The other four belongs to a different category. It's once you know, once you figure out the pattern, it's it should be pretty quick. Oh, let me stop the recorder and I'm 